right, welcome back to the No Morning Show here on TTT. I am Natalie Legor. And it's time for your favorite segment, Your Body and You, where we look at all the issues, all the health challenges that might be affecting you, especially during this time of COVID. And I know a lot of you have doubts as to whether or not you should get vaccinated, especially if you have any circulatory, any heart issues. So, of course, with me this morning again is Dr. Ravi Ramlal, who is a heart disease specialist, cardiologist, and he's just here to talk to us about that. So welcome back, Doc. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning, Natalie. Thank you for having me. You're most welcome. So let's start with this whole uh, fear that if we have any heart issues, whether or not we should get the vaccine. Should we? So uh, the key thing to remember is that if you have a comorbidity like heart disease, it's very likely that if you catch COVID, your outcomes are going to be worse. Yeah. So all my patients in the clinic, I recommend usually knowing about the small chance of clot, um, one or 10 in a million, right? It's, it's relatively small, but the benefit yeah. is humongous. And I think that's what we're not sold on, Doc. For the, for the doubters, for the people who we've been speaking to, one of the questions I hear all the time, why should I even take the vaccine? Because it doesn't protect me from catching COVID. It doesn't ensure that I can do without a mask or social distancing. So why should I take the vaccine? Well, two things, really. The first one is that if you are exposed and unfortunately get infected with COVID, the vaccine serves as a very important uh, carrier in terms of the immune system. It actually sensitize the immune system to say, hey, I've seen this before, so I can now mount a response and fight it. Yeah. So the degree of your infection will be quite less. You're less likely to have severe COVID, less likely to end up in the ICU on a ventilator, and less likely to die. All right, but, but can't your body do that, your immune system do that just the same if you catch COVID without being vaccinated to say, hey, here is something that is foreign, let me mount a response? It can do that. But remember, in the vaccine, it's particles that's not truly the aggressive particle of the virus. It's something that mirrors, right, proteins that you inoculate or you get an injection for. And over time, your body has relatively a benign protein in the body. So it can respond appropriately. Whereas you have the aggressive COVID virus ravaging through your body as a very dangerous pathogen, yeah. then your body will be overwhelmed. And when it's overwhelmed, you can start to shut down multiple organs, not only primarily the lungs, the heart can be in, inflamed you know, a condition called myocarditis, mm -hmm. which, which we're seeing more and more among COVID patients. So this is something you need to be very mindful of, because if you have the vaccine, then you're going to neutralize some of it yeah. in a way, yeah. and then hopefully, um, ultimately, be less likely to end up in the ICU or die from it. And Doc, as a cardiologist, how do you convince that person who is saying, well, 80% of us who catch the COVID will be fine, and up to 95% of us won't die. So for that 5%, I mean, we don't know where we're going to fall, but it's the same kind of ratio of looking at who will get a blood clot to who won't. So why should I take the vaccine? Because I think these are all the questions that are out there for the, for the learned mind who is thinking, okay, let me do the calculations. Does this really pan out? So one of the key things, I think we need to just step back and look at the international level. When you look at the international level, let's just take India, for example, where a variant has developed. And this variant has now actually become quite uh, severely infective and causing a high mortality among the Indian yeah. population. Right. So when you look at should you get it in Trinidad setting, Imagine you're trying to prevent a Trinidadian variant that could become as aggressive as India. Yeah. So we know there's a P1 variant that's going around right now. And we know that the variants seem to be more infectious. Yeah. And, and, and just recently, you know, the, the deaths has gone up quite significantly, right? And some of it is attributable to 
uh, the P1 possibly. Yeah. So it's very important for us. This vaccine is actually beneficial against that variant. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the additional reasons I would say you should get it. All right. All right. Well, I hope that people are convinced after listening to you that it's important, even if you know, they might be thinking, listen, we might be fine. The reality is that we don't know, especially when we're hearing from the Ministry of Health, that there are healthy people in their 30s, in their 40s, without any pre-existing conditions, without any comorbidities, who are just dying as a result of COVID-19, right here in Trinidad and Tobago. And I think this should be a warning for the general public of Trinidad and Tobago. You need to still do all your public health measures. Put yeah. your mask on, wash your hands. You need to social distance. Even if you get the vaccine, your disease might be less severe. You may be an asymptomatic carrier carrying to your loved ones. Yeah. So that's where the public hygiene is very important, social distancing. So you have to have to do that. Yeah. Don't forget it. If you get the vaccine, don't think all is well. Continue your social distancing, continue what is necessary. Yeah, and I think that's going to be the hard sell for the government to let people know, even though if you get the vaccine, you have to keep up these measures. You have to ensure you wash your hands, you know. And I think we've learned quite a bit since the pandemic started that hygiene is so important to how sick we are or to how sick we get that if you just wash those hands and keep half of those germs out, we don't even have as much people with flu. That's right. Yeah. The, the, the number of flu cases that we had in Trinidad is actually very, very low. Yes, because we're washing our mm -hmm. hands. You think after the pandemic, if people will keep doing that, Doc, like just realize that, listen, this is good for me. Let me just, and it's so simple, you know, let me just wash my hands. I think it's been in green over a year. And as time progresses, it will probably be another year again before. So it'll just come a second nature to most of us. So I, I think it will continue. I hope so. All right, Doc. So last <coughs> week we looked a lot at, you know, you know, how the heart works. So, you know, comparing it to a house, what are the walls, what's the plumbing? you know, that kind of thing, and I, I was the electricity, and I think people got the general idea. I was surprised, though, because, you know, when we're here talking about the vagina, the views online are ridiculous. So I, I, you think that people somehow don't pay as much attention to these vital organs as such as the heart? And the funny thing is, it kills us more than the vagina and the penis. That's right. You know, I think it's, it's a, a, you know, the vagina and penis is, is, is such a, a common taboo topic in Trinidad and Tobago. Whereas when someone here the heart, you know, it doesn't think much of it. They think, oh, it's just heart disease. I have, I'm, I'm a heart patient. And they don't think the heart necessarily among the general population. They seem to be like, oh, I could take some herbal medications and I'll get better. Yeah. You know, it's a, a, a bit varied in terms of the way they view heart disease in Trinidad and Tobago. Although it is the number one cause of death mm -hmm. and it is the number one cause of you actually going on um, some sort of social assistance or needing help because you can't walk from five steps, you know, Without because feeling tired, extremely yeah. short of breath. Yeah. So you have people walking around with heart percentage of five, ten percent. And, and those are the ones that are quite preventable. Yeah. So how do we get there, Doc? We wanted to look at, you know, some of the underlying causes of these heart diseases in Trinidad and Tobago. I think we, we mentioned the cholesterol the last time you were here and, you know, just any kind of circulatory issues. But what are some of those underlying causes that can lead to heart disease? Right. So there are certain risk factors that we talked about. So like last week, how we mirrored everything, you know, there's the conduit, which is the arteries. Right. And when that arteries get blocked, that's the most common cause of a heart attack. What if the vein gets blocked? It's, it's a bit different. It's, it's really the arterial supply that gives you a lot of blood and nutrition and oxygen to the blood, to the muscle of the heart, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the, when the veins get blocked off, there are different components but it's quite rare for that to happen. The most common thing is you have the cholesterol plaque that we talked about, the right. little pimple that grows within the blood vessels of the heart, right? So when you have the cholesterol buildup, you should understand that cholesterol is made up of a lot of different things. 25% of your cholesterol is actually produced by what you take in. The remainder is produced by your liver. 
right? Mm -hmm. So it's very, very important to be mindful of the components of cholesterol. Yeah. So you have your good cholesterol and your bad cholesterol. Your HDL, which is your good cholesterol. This is like a WD-40 for your arteries, Oh, right? It makes sure the bad cholesterol, which is your LDL, mm -hmm. make sure that don't really attach to the wall. Right. And we spoke about how important diet is to our heart health. Are there foods that we can consume that can make our cholesterol get high or can contribute to more bad cholesterol in our system? Yes, there, there are a lot of foods that we can uh, try to eat and try to avoid. Um, what is important is if we could actually go on to eating a lot of um, polyunsaturated fats, so things from olive oil, canola oil rather than your deep fried, you know, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of things in Trinidad is deep fried. Yes. And your, your KFC, I know a lot of Trinidadians like the KFC. They but don't like, Doc, you saw those lines, they love their KFC. <laughs> it's, it's quite long, <laughs> yes, it's quite long, yes. right? Yeah. And, and, and the double, so it's, it's really fatty foods. Exactly. And so any deep fried, fried, so do, is it that we just need to avoid those kind of foods? So I think it's very important to recognize that if you try to say you're not going to have one, one doubles in your life, you'll limit yourself. Again, instead of having 10 doubles on a morning, just have one, right. right? You're going to have KFC, have it once a month, you know, because you're going to try your best to do all the lifestyle changes that you need to do and limit the amount of intake of bad cholesterol which is uh, saturated fats exactly yeah yeah so that's a lot of your where a lot of the bad cholesterol comes from your ldl now one of the interesting things you know a lot of trinis they have these amazing songs about rum and alcohol yeah you know? <laughs> so um, and, and you hear it every friday you're driving a car you're hearing it you know um one of the key things that alcohol does it increases your triglycerides right and it affects the liver. And since your liver produces cholesterol, then oh. when you continually burden your liver with alcohol, you're definitely affecting your the cholesterol, cholesterol levels. Yeah. So somebody might say they're slim, they're healthy, they don't have any heart conditions, but they drink a lot. And next thing you know, their cholesterol is high and they end up with some kind of heart disease. Exactly. And not only that, and you know, I've seen people who drink excessive amount of alcohol end up with a what we call alcohol heart disease. Yeah. There's something known as alcohol heart disease. Doc, I hear people out here talking that they're not, they're going to drink the alcohol because they're going to kill the COVID. <laughs> and you know, you've seen a lot of TikTok <laughs> where people spray alcohol into the mouth, right? Um, so I think it's very important to recognize that, first of all, that's not going to kill COVID. Yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Myth number, you know, get Myth out of your mind. You know. Alcohol is not going to kill COVID, okay? But the hand sanitizer that has alcohol in it is going to keep you safe. So what's different? What's different between the hand sanitizer, the alcohol <laughs> in it, and just drinking it? Well, a lot of it has to do with actually trying to kill the bugs, right? That's in your hand. You could put your hand on your face, right? Your hand may have been many places. Mm -hmm. That then you take a nice deep breath of COVID infected air right. from your hands. So you really, your hands are touching a lot of different places. Yeah, but Doug, they say that the gut is where all diseases start. That that balance there. So if the alcohol goes down there, it doesn't kill the COVID. I'm telling you, these are real discussions. <laughs> <laughs> Not around now, these are real discussions out there. You know. I don't want to ensure that the people of Trinidad and Tobago don't leave after today with the dotishness. Eh? So Doug, tell them, tell them why. You know, the alcohol in the hand sanitizer can kill the COVID, but consuming it might work differently. Okay, so 99% of all whatever bacteria or viruses are usually, what the proteins on the walls of these viruses are actually killed, Yeah. right? The problem is when you not only drink alcohol, you, you may damage the lining of your stomach. You yeah. may damage the natural bacteria. Everybody has bacteria the, in this system. The natural flora and fauna. Exactly. <laughs> of the stomach. Uh, exactly. And all of that will be affected and changed. So it's, it's, it's a, a valid question for, I guess, anybody is out there thinking about it. And it makes sense. It yeah. makes sense. But you have to remember that there are bad 
effects of alcohol and high amount of alcohol, like we talked about the cholesterol, mm -hmm. it affects the liver. Uh, you could go on and on about stomach ulcers, you know, yeah. people vomiting blood from high amount of excessive alcohol intake over prolonged periods of time. So, and sl sclerosis of the liver, that's something uh, that's... Cirrhosis perfect. of the liver, yeah. yeah, and that happens over a long time cirrhosis as well. Cirrhosis of the liver. So, in terms of the heart, when you drink a lot of alcohol too, you could get this fluttering uh, condition where you're beating it irregular. You know, you had some good music this morning, well in tune. Yeah. So, when, when, when the heart beating out of tune, which a condition we call atrial fibrillation, there is an increased risk for getting stroke. So, alcohol consumption needs to be really limited and, and watch that. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and take the, 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 the Friday song just f as songs. Yeah. You know, don't necessarily... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Doc, I also wanted to revisit the conversation that we had last week about, you know, symptoms. The symptoms that should tell us, go and see whether a general practitioner, cardiologist, because as you said, we like to talk about gas. You know, we get a little pain here. Oh, it's gas and the gas move. We tell ourselves that the gas is moving. I, I don't know how these things work because I don't know that I've ever had gas that moves all over my body. You know, but what are those symptoms that we should say, listen, this might be related to our hearts. Apart from the, the irregular heartbeat or the racing of the heart or the shortness of the breath, what else? The most, well, when you look at the general data and most we patients present who are not usually diabetic and not the elderly, the vast majority of people actually get severe chest pain. So when you get chest pain, when you walk a short distance, right, that's actually a warning sign that you have narrowed arteries. That's due to the cholesterol buildup, right? Once you have severe pain, sometimes it may relate to the jaw. Some people may just not even have this pain in the chest but they have real jaw pain and they think it's a tooth. So they're mm -hmm. going to the dentist. They're going to the dentist all the time. They're saying I have a jaw, you know, well, I have to take all my, my teeth. Yeah. They, they, they go to the dentist and the dentist say, but everything's fine. Then it takes an intuitive dentist to say, well, maybe it's from the heart, right? Mm -hmm. So these are other ways in which heart disease can present. The typical, typical presentation is severe chest pain read it into the jaw, sometimes people feel very nauseous. Before that, you may actually get little warning signs that I tell you about, where you get chest pain walking a short distance, or chest pain walking up a flight of stairs. What about numbness of the hands? So the numbness of the hands sometimes can happen because it's radiation. The heart, the nerves on the heart, actually cause something called referred pain. So in different areas, you may get tingling or sensation or pain. So sometimes people will get shoulder pain a lot of shoulder pain. But to tell the difference is that one of the main things is if you lift, you know, at 250 pounds, uh, you're in the gym all the time, and you get in pain, when you're not accustomed lifting, yeah. then it's most likely attributable to musculoskeletal problems, muscle problems, rather than from the heart. But if you have a lot of heart disease, um, uh, a history of heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, your cholesterol is abnormal, and a family history, the probability that these sensation when you're exercising is a high probability that you may have narrowing arteries. Doc, what tests can we do to check our hearts? What is it that we do? Is it an echo, an ECG? What do people do when they go to their doctor to say, let's make sure that we have a healthy heart? Right. So one of the key things is going back to looking at the risk factors. So as an interventional cardiologist, I really want to focus on the general public at Trinidad to try to prevent the disease. Because right now, the public sector is overflowing with people with heart disease that need their arteries fixed. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very challenging across the public, across the nation. So what we have to focus on is preventing it. So I'll get to the question with regards to where you're asking what test. But I think I really want to make sure that we understand the risk factors for developing these problems. So. Once you have diabetes, if actually what's your name, you're going to say natural. Yes. All diabetics, all diabetics in Trinidad and Tobago should make sure they know the HbA1c or your A1c value, right? That is a test that we checked to also make the diagnosis of diabetes. But once you're diabetic, you're what's the range? 
the range generally is less than seven is what we want. Minus 4.1, I think. So that's good. That's good. But if you have an abnormal range, right, and usually 6.5 is what we use to make the diagnosis with symptoms and blood sugar testing. So if you're six, you're at pre-diabetes. Well, some people may think so. But what we have to do is confirm the test with doing your fasting blood sugar, and then we might want to do a glucose tolerance test to see which range you actually fall in. But the biggest concern is a lot of people who are diabetic in Trinidad have no idea what's A1C. When you talk to them, yeah. they're like, what's that? No, I've done the HB1 Yeah, so HbA1c. Yeah. But what happens is they can't remember HbA1c. So if you say A1c, they tend to remember A1c. Right. When you, you know, it's it's a lot long. If right. you just say A1c, they tend to remember that. So so diabetes, hypertension. You are talking about the risk factors. What else? Right. So one of the, so once what this does, right? With the HbA1c it actually measures your blood sugar. It's like a, a security boot. It's like a guard in your, in your body. So it actually measures your sugar over three months. Other people come and say, well, doc, my morning reading is OK. My evening reading is OK. But they're telling you that two months ago, they eat a lot of cake, a lot of ice cream, a lot of right. sugars, right? So that's why your number is very important. You have to know your HbA1c. So that can tell you something about your, under, your heart. Yes, because if it's uncontrolled, you're at increased risk, not only for eyes, for your, your heart, for your kidneys, for the legs. Yeah. Right? So All right. Doc, you realize you're out, you know how many times my director has told me, Natalie, you're out of time. Oh. But I just know how critical the discussion is. So I was just asking you, you know, what was the last question I asked you? The so risk the, factors? Yes. And the so tests. hypertension and the test. What tests do right. we do to test our heart? So the test, you, you should all go get, if you have a history of heart disease, you only know if you get your blood drawn, you check your cholesterol. That's how you know it's going to be high. There's no other real way. Right. right? Urge everybody to check the blood pressures. If you have high blood pressure, monitor your blood pressure. Right? I think if you have a 120 to 130, it should be suspicious. You know, there's a lot of changes during the day, but be very suspicious so that you can now act very fast to say, should I talk to my general practitioner? Should I involve a healthcare person? Because now I can now make changes from diet to yeah. help what's going on with my heart, right? Yeah. Um, so your blood pressure checks is important. Checking to see if you're diabetic with your HbA1c. Checking your cholesterol levels, yeah. right? Your bad and your good cholesterol. And then um, once you reach to my stage and where you might see a cardiologist, we would want to do a stress test where we screen, put you on a treadmill, see how fast you can run, and whether you get symptoms or not with the ECG changes. As well as we may want to do an echocardiogram that will show how the heart function is, how it's squeezing, the valves. Right. And that may even suggest if a wall isn't moving well, there might be some narrowings. Right. All right, Doc, I want to thank you so much for your wealth of knowledge. And let's hope that people are really listening and internalizing and paying attention and that they'll come and see you. Because if you're telling me that the public sector is rife with heart disease, it means that we need intervention and we need to take stock of where we are. Yes, we really do. Thank you for having me. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Rafi Ramlal, there talking to us. For your body and you. And remember, we will put that interview for you on social media on the Now Facebook page, so check us out. We'll be back.